Okay. So, uh, hello everyone. Okay, we're live. So this is part two. Um, part one, there was an issue. I had to disconnect, so I apologize for for that to the audience. But this is the effort to continue it in part two. So decency opens the curtains of divinity. And if I was correct, I was going through a quote tunnel. on the idea of decency. There's a quote from Theodore Roosevelt that says the most practical kind of politics is the politics of decency. That means the most decent politician wins. Decent nature. Deborah Kerr. I respect anyone who has to fight and howl for his decency. Paulo Coelho. Oh, sorry, not Paulo Coelho. Pablo, Pablo Casals. See, see. C-A-S-A-L-S. -S. I don't know how to say that. Pablo. Pablo says, each person has inside a basic decency and goodness. If he listens to it and acts on it, he's giving a great deal of what it is, what it is the world needs most. It is not complicated, but it takes courage. It takes courage for a person to listen to his own goodness and act on it. You know, Pablo hit the ball out of the park. Pablo Casals also says, I do not think a day passes in my life in which I fail to look with fresh amazement at the miracle of nature. You know, it's a person, like like a person looks at themselves, and, oh my God, am I being energy right now? <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, the, the notion of decency. And so what kind of curtain does it open and what does it imply uh, about divinity. So divinity, first of all, we're going to ask Saint Dictionary. <laughs> we're going to see the dictionary. I'm going to, I'm going to read for you the definition of it. Just to see how the word has been understood by common, by like the world over. And then I'm going to tell you what I feel divinity is, which it can't even be a concept. It has to do with the direct experience with the moment. But it's a sort of reverence of the unknown rather than per se a known method of getting somewhere. So first, let's see decency. Let's see what the dictionary has to say. So decency, behavior that conforms to accepted standards of morality or respectability. Behavior or appearance that avoids impro impropriety or immodesty. The requirements of accepted or respectable behavior. Decencies, things required for a reasonable standard of life. And it's from Latin, decentia. Are you kidding? That's such a badass name, decentia. I feel like I can create a character, sci-fi character out of that. Dissentia, a world where human beings have, are, whether they like it or not, they're all decent. <laughs> Where's the pen when you need it? <laughs> Just a second, guys.
Now let's see the word divinity. Let's see what the dictionary finds as divine. <laughs> the state or quality of being divine, a divine being a god or goddess, the divinity god. In theolo uh, theology, the study of religion, theology. So divinity, oh yeah, like I'm mean, divinity studies. So like, buddy, I gotta, I got, <laughs> I've been studying divinity my whole life. You kidding me? <laughs> Um, for me, there was this concept of you don't chase the butterfly. You sit among the flowers and the butterfly, the divine butterfly lands on your forehead. That means instead of you running after something, you change the antenna. You know what it is that that notion of not chasing the butterfly is that decency it's also how this where the where the core strength and foundation of honor comes from so I would say it's as if in life you the person has the mentality of chasing after something And the person suddenly sees, instead of them chasing something, you make yourself more capable of receiving it. There's a quote by Rumi, he says, your task is not to seek love, but get rid of all the barriers you have made against it. That means it's like everybody's loving, but it, it, there's endless barriers in between them. <laughs> We're actually loving beings on this earth, but all these war and savageness, these are just barriers. <laughs> The civilization has to find a way of treating itself more than a thought, and I don't know how it's going to do it. It's, it's like the next great game to play where we're going to wonder what it means to be a human being when we are fully capable of observing the, tempor the temporalness of how matter comes and goes and how thoughts come and go. And so we are just in the middle of two movements in synchronization. I don't know if anybody's made a video compilation, but there was, um, I made this like years ago, years, years ago. <laughs> So long ago, no, no, I'm joking, not that long ago, but it was like, I, it was definitely way before 2000, I think 2009 or something. I made this soccer video and I put a EDM track behind the soccer video. It was like this footage of this soccer player. And there was, a, I just put music and there was for a second, the movement, the person who had made the compilation video, uh, matched exactly the sound and the music. Like it was in sync with the music. So what I'm trying to imply is that when there's two types of movement, they synchronize. And so it's like there is a physical movement and there is there's an objective movement and there's a subjective in the mo movement in the moment. And so in the middle of these two streams colliding, we're like, yo, I'm a person here. You know?
there's moments in life where it is worth fighting for one's superiority but there's moments where there one must realize that they should also fight for their simplicity you know that means the more in, intense life becomes the more there is to handle it's as if the more the forces are more wild so decency in the concrete jungle means caring for the potential regardless of the outcome you know imagine a civilization where uh, a human being where any human being who fell instantly there were human beings that raised you know it was it was as if the civilization deserved all it could get you know there was glories of empires you know and so that idea it's just now remotely alive in movies and uh, books and games but it's it's this notion of that there was something we were building and i feel when that gets forgotten a civilization gets closer to inner extinction when they forget the song that's being played the four billion year old effort the four billion year old science project that's just left here so for me i would say there's a decency the the, the it's like it depends on the nature of your work you know if the person wants to work with the unknown they have to be content with their knowledge and I don't know how many people are comfortable just being in a moment completely unknown you know it's as if uh, any sort of archetype or symbol given to the ultimate intelligence uh, in whatever context it's like once we took the mask of God off the truth was unknown the truth is the unknown I feel this this sentence that the truth is the unknown is the only thing we never thought as creatures on a rock endlessly trying to know through our own simulated systems of what we feel is real Okay. <clears throat> what can be said? We're either decent beings or we're not. <laughs> like seriously. And this thing about divinity, I don't know. There's some things in life where you got to engage it. You got to live for the soul of the for that for the soul of the wonder of that moment. But there's times where when you don't look for something and it finds you, there's a quote that Shakespeare has. He says, Some people are born great. 
Some people achieve greatness. And some have greatness thrust upon them. I feel 8 billion people are in the last situation where greatness is thrust upon an evolutionary being that in some sense the intelligence hasn't been this far. The inner realms can animate, the person can evoke any image in their inner realms, they can observe the inner realms from the outer realms as moving, they can observe the inner realms transforming into any sort of language or dialogue with the same capacity a person can tell you to visualize something else, like visualize a square, visualize a circle. You see, it's, it's like you can instantly visualize it, so the instantaneity, the unconditionalness to the, to the imagination there is a point. I don't know. I, for me, for me, it's as if like when the story is less significant than the experience. I think revelation is when the unknown is being known. Divinity is when the unknown moves the known. Just the declaration of the idea of divine, just the reverence for the awe, that attention perhaps is uh, meshed in with everything that is keeping it here. You know, we, we think of ourselves as such humble, small beings, you know, not realizing that uh, aside from celestial, giant celestial orbs, we are the secret details of life. That means just the fact that there's an atmosphere, just the fact that we're all on a sphere with an atmosphere and we can go beyond that atmosphere. Moments where I have felt <clears throat> the unknown move my sense of knowing were moments where I was very preference, preferenceless to what I knew, what I felt I know. It was more like walking. You know, I could say the mystical approach, or at least the way I've experienced it, is that you first feel ideologically oriented because there's a sort of stoic urge for uh, to be that enlightened uh, idea. But when you really look at it, it's like the light is in everybody's eyes. <laughs> the light is in everybody's eyes. And so what's very fascinating is that the light is an information carrier system. Light is carrying, it's like the smallest energy carrier system in the cosmos. <clears throat> that means an advanced civilization would probably be able to use a sun as a sort of broadcasting uh, life all over the universe kind of system. <laughs> I don't know. There was a time where there were Im there were images to my inner realms. I, I entertained the notion that uh, uh, I was way more theosophical oriented. Then after getting introduced to Zen and realizing that the notion or the idea of the soul literally means the unknown x variable in the mathematical equation, the unknown is um, watching the known. And the known is staring at the unknown. And there is a fascination that is beaming between both worlds. I think divinity should be seen as when there is enough decency, it unlocks an event of nature never, that has never been possible. 
You see, either we feel that the designs are there, the potential for greatness is there, it just has to be activated, or if we feel there is no greatness and we have to create it anew. <clears throat> so either way, there is effort involved, and that effort, uh, when it comes to your inner realms, like, you're not an idea. I don't know how people, like, it's not, it's not like in the inner realms you can call yourself a thought. You're the one witnessing it, witnessing thoughts come and go. In 2015, I was giving a talk in UK. There was this bench I would sit where I remember I recorded like the first couple hundred there. And when I would sit on that bench, there was a moment where I remember I had in my whole life, I had fathomed myself moving in the world. And even I had the notion of the world moving. But for a moment, it was as if my moment was moving before me. And that was the first time where there was an animate experience where it wasn't like a <clears throat> Casper ghost like, I don't know what it's like you see in movies kind of thing. It was more like the whole moment moved with a resonance that with a, with a momentum, with a rhythm that it was separate to the individual uh, container, if I can say. So in that moment, I started to notice, I'm like, okay, wait a minute, maybe, maybe antennas aren't just on our roofs. Maybe the brain is an incredibly complex biological antenna, and maybe we're just figuring it out. Maybe we still don't know how it accurately works, but we know that we are receiving in a sight as signals. It's like, imagine the person's like, you know, uh, hey man, can you not put that light on my face? And the person's, it's like the sun, and the sun's like, what do you do? What do you want me to do, man? It's just like my job. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, is like, I don't know, you can dance between the micro and the macro. Eventually you see you got to live life and you got to have the humility and the trust to just go with what you've got. <laughs> I can't tell you how much of life it's just an effort to continue. <laughs> it's like all, all, re all meaning can come to this, that we care for something. That's it. You want to know what history is about? We cared for something. <laughs> We at least cared enough to write it down, you know. <laughs> Guys, I'm going to let this go to 45 minutes. So, um, questions are welcome during this time. <laughs> You know what's fascinating? One third of life, they say, the person is asleep. One third of it, you're just transporting. You're just going around places. And one third of it, you're, you actually have the opportunity to really be. So, we have one-third of our lifetime to truly get to see what kind of instrument our DNA was. And my approach is that I understand. It's as if when, you know, it's as if like the black sheep cried even though it was walking against the herd. Oh, sorry, uh, the black sheep cried as it was walking, uh, yeah, against the herd. That's the story. The black sheep cried, wondering what is the meaning when the world is going one way and your eyes as a being are going another. There's so many ways to live in this world. There's a quote 
by Rumi, he says there's 10,000 ways to kneel down and kiss the earth. That means, can you imagine, can you imagine what kind of mindset is required to make you whoever you are for a second, whoever you are, wherever, to just kneel down, and this may sound strange, you may be a person like a busy CEO or, you know, listening to this, but it's like this idea of just kneel down for a moment and kiss the world that you are in once every day. There's, there's something incredible about the nature of the mind that the, well, if the world is more mind than matter, then our attitude has a, is more is like the elder of matter. <laughs> that means the Stoics, of course, there were, there were certain Stoics who were savage. I mean, who wasn't savage back in the day? But there was also those who said, like those of the likes of Epictetus, where he would say, we do not suffer from the events in our lives. We suffer, uh, we suffer not from the events in our lives, but from the judgments we have about them. That means imagine anything, everything that has happened to you so far in this life, it's an event. Now, what you felt that meant, that was one room where the meaning was, and there were also so many other rooms. You can see, you can go and share your problem with one person and get 10 different viewpoints, you know? That's the orphan strategy. <laughs> that means I understand that the orphan situation, of course, is very intense. But the way I'm saying this is respectfully in the sense that when there is no option the person calls to their world. That means is imagine a time where there was no police back in the day in medieval context. People would just shout for help and there was only people to respond. <clears throat> you know, I'll tell you something fascinating. In, in let's say, developing, developed countries, do you know, Western countries, when there is an accident that happens on the street, um, people wait for the authorities. Nobody does anything. People just watch from a distance. <clears throat> in a Middle Eastern con in country, or you can say in Eastern countries or places like India or anywhere, in developing countries, uh, <clears throat> even this way of classification can be updated, but like developing countries, um, there's, you know what happens when a tragedy happens on the street? People. Because there's so much traffic, there's no way. People are like, there's no way the police is going to get here. And that people, actual human beings, run and save people. Because regardless of these lives that we live with name tags and whatnot, with personality notebooks and whatnot, <laughs> there is a human dimension that is just our design. That means if you honor your humanness, you require to honor the, the collective humanness of your species. Like, it's like the advantage. It's like, I was like, why, why have we been stripped of this honor? Why has the human empire been limited to walls? That means, what if there was a sort of mentality that was like, let's see what the efficient looks like. So that means, for the first time, we had to sacrifice the inefficient. Now, what does that mean? It depends on you as a designer, and that's why I brought the concept of piloting. So I could say any moment of divinity I've experienced, it's been a moment where the world has been piloting, you know, and I have been kind of like more like in the co-pilot. And there's been moments where I have been piloting and I have felt just the, the whole field of just my whole moment has been, you know, it's as if, it's as if like, the same way a person has thoughts, it's as if wondering uh, if man is the thoughts of uh, the heavens, if earth is a thought in heaven, in the mind of heaven, poetically.
Of course, every system, every place in the world has its advantages and disadvantages. I mean, just like this lighter, you know. <laughs> This decency is crucial. I'm pretty sure any parent in the world understands this, that you have to be gentler with the world that's being raised. It's as if we, it is true that we're all evolutionary beings, but we're not all evolved to have access to everything in the same way. Now this, on one angle, we're like, oh, we're not equal. What is this? What kind of system are we living in? We're not treated equally. And then on another angle, we're like, wait a minute, if we were equal, would that make us clones? So maybe there's an advantage in our uniqueness. You know, maybe, maybe the fact that there is strangeness in the world, that's how world updates. You know, maybe strange people are updating the world. You know, they don't realize. <laughs> I mean, nothing is like you could say everything is strange in the sense that like people wore top hats back in the day. Now you wear a top hat, someone looks at you, you know, it's like, what's wrong with you, man? What's wrong? <laughs> but back in the day, if you didn't have a top hat on, they'll be like, disrespect, you know, they'll get angry at you, you know? They'll be like, you don't honor civilization? How dare you? How dare <laughs> It is true that <clears throat> from the yogic standpoint, there is sometimes the search of desire could be a lie of the actual contentment of the being. It's like Superman actually thinking he's working, you know, in a newspaper agency. I think it's an ability to <clears throat> identify and notice different uh, rooms of sensitivity. So there is an objective room, which right now I'm in. Then my imagination, it has design, but it's not tangible. I don't know, the best way to explain it would be like the vision of the two birds. There's some, there's something in life, some, some aspect to you which is like a bird on a branch which has never moved and there's a component to your moment of being which is a bird that has always been moving. It's as if one part of the brain is like, yo, I'm going to release energy and another part of the energy is like, hold on, man. Hold on. <clears throat> so... I mean, really, it is an energetic movement, correct? That means you can say, who can judge energy? So existentially, the more we think of ourselves as matter and existence, we are equal in existential value. It is only our experiences that separate us and make us a unique part of existence. So ultimately, to function in a civilization means you have to recalibrate the experiencer. And this is being done automatically, so every person through every experience, every moment they're going through, it's as if they're, there's a sort of update of their perception. But then I think it has to do with how much the inner realms feel free. So there's this notion that you got to free the inner realms from the outer realms or you got to free the outer realms from the inner realms. <clears throat> to free the inner realms from the outer realms means you notice 
uh, like what people call the soul is just energy conscious of itself. And if energy, uh, you can say, for, based on the law of thermodynamics, cannot be created or destroyed, but can just change from one form to another, you can totally see the notion of this endless, uh, it's like intelligence doesn't have a face, but it's what's giving everything a face. Intelligence is the face of our civilization. Now we can choose to wash that face and aim for a new day, or people can choose to just, you know, selfish, you know, selfishly to land it. <laughs> Some fishermen are listening to this and like, you know, whoa, Mister, within it, you know, it's like, take it easy there. <laughs> Anyways, guys, I'm going to share one last story, and then uh, I'm going to fly out of here. <laughs> I'm just going to fly out the window into the endless void of space, you know? There's this story of this temple, this Zen temple, monastery. There is a bunch of students. Now what happens is they start seeing one of the students uh, is stealing. And there's a guru, <clears throat> the Zen master, you know. One of the disciples goes to the Zen master and says, Hey man, this, there's someone stealing. What is this? You got to kick this guy out. He, he tells his name. The Zen master is like, forget it. You know. The guy keeps stealing and the the all the disciples are like, what the fuck, this is messed up. So, you know, the next time happens, like a group of them go, sir, please, you know, do something. And he's like, forget him, for, you know, forgive him. Then they get fed up. And all the disciples take that one disciple who was stealing and they take him to the Zen master and they all shout. And they're like, listen, either you kick this guy out or we all leave. And there's this ultimate like moment of pause and silence where they're like, what's going to happen? Like if it was a movie, you'd be just like chewing your popcorn slower. You know? <laughs> the Zen master looks at his disciples and says, you guys know right from wrong. You guys can leave. This poor brother, this poor soul, doesn't even know the difference between right and wrong. And if I don't teach him, who will? And it's in that moment where I remember reading it online, the sentence was like a torrent of tears found the eyes of the disciples. Why? Because that's how civilization evolves, when we don't fear the weak. We add to the strong. Because why not? How else can we build an advanced civilization? I say it like hilariously, you know, it's like what? The birds are going to come and build an advanced civilization? <laughs> it's like the squirrels and birds are like, humanity, you don't know what you're doing, let us give it a try. And we're like, after like, you know centuries we see just like a big nest <laughs> so anyways guys that's the moral of the story that your decency is how you are on some natural level based on experiencing the event, you know what's right and wrong. You can see it. And I feel that's the thing. That's the ultimate spirituality is in, in, in just metaphysics. It, it's all in that word. If, if the person doesn't pass through the portal of decentia, decency,
I mean, you got to be decent because you got, it's like, you got to trust something, you know. <laughs> Even the nihilist is trusting nothing. You know, you go up to a nihilist and you're like, hey man, what if nothing isn't nothing? And the nihilist be like, no bro, no, don't, don't take nothing away from me. <laughs> Anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. I have no idea what this wallpaper statue is from. Um, but I feel that's Christ, uh, and that's, uh, yeah, it says Jesus right there, <laughs> and so you can just see all these birds, I mean, guys, I gotta share, uh, share a story from Attar before I end off, when there's so many birds in the wallpaper, like, <clears throat> Attar, this, um, Sufi mystic from Neshapur, yes, I'll read it for you, of some passages from this book, it's called The Conference of the Birds, and this Sufi mystic, um, wrote this, I don't know, like a thousand years ago or something, like 900 years ago, bro. <laughs> History knows better. <laughs> um, all right, guys, here, let me see. 13 Conference of the Birds, Quotes and Sayings, there we go. So first, I'm going to tell you, the conference of the birds was in Persian mythology. There's the idea of the phoenix, and this phoenix uh, had gone through three apocalypses, in some sense. Now, all the birds in the world, in Attar's poetry, mystical poetry, he says all the birds in the world one day decide to go find this phoenix, and they all fly together like the birds in this wallpaper. They all fly together the sky and they fly so long searching for this ultimate bird, the phoenix, that eventually many of the birds, they just stop flying. They stop flying. They just get tired. They're like, okay, there's no phoenix. What is this? We're flying too much. You know? <laughs> They're like, how have you been flying this long? <laughs> and so many of the birds give up. And as they fly longer and longer in search of the phoenix, in search of this ultimate truth, eventually only 30 birds are left. And these birds have committed to this flight so much, they're like, okay, they're like, oh, they're, I'm in it. <laughs> you know? So it's a situation where in, in, uh, the phoenix, in Attar's poetry, the word for phoenix is Seymour, which means 30 birds. The 30 birds eventually realize they are the phoenix. They manage to endure endlessly towards uh, the height, the high, a height they had never been before. Because, you know, it's all about the steps of the mind. You know, it's like we can see technology accelerating, exponentially accelerating. I was like, why not the mind of the person? Maybe we can, we can do that through some sort of geometrical uh, language. For me, geometry has been so important with divinity. That means if somebody tells me what the veil is, I would say there's a sort of geometry to reality where based on how the mind has behaved, it can perceive. So when you reach a certain, let's say, um, uh, a collective memory where you're not an individual, you're not a shape. So it's, there, it's not that there isn't behavior, there is always knowing. Because the knowing seems to be like a, from a greater layer of the onion. You know, I feel we are a world inside a world, we just don't realize it yet. You know, in one of my poems I said, what if the world is inside a sun and we just don't realize it. <laughs> Like, it's such a big sun that the edge of the universe is, like, is the edge, is edge of the sun, I mean. So that's the thing. You gotta care for something and just walk towards it and life will happen. What else can happen? <laughs> so anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. And uh, I'm gonna share a Discord link. Um, where anybody interested for philosophical discussion, discussion can uh, access. That's the link.
So thanks for tuning in, guys. The talk has ended at this point. Blessings. Hello? Welcome, guys. Can you...
yeah.